GPT public policy course here at the university. Uh, tonight we're going to be hearing about uh, sexual behavior in different settings and different cultures. Uh, sex researcher Christopher Ryan in conversation with National Public Radio uh, Peter Stable. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all, all our sponsors. Our first sponsor was the uh, Office of LGBT Student Life. Our second sponsor was the amazing undergraduate LGBT group, uh, Course and Associates. Um, our third sponsor was the Center uh, for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. And our last sponsor was the University of Chicago Sex Magazine, uh, Vida Esmeralda. So Christopher Ryan is the author of um, Sex and Dawn, the Historic Origins of Modern Sexuality, a book that has uh, been described by sex advice columnist Dan Savage as the single most important book about human sexuality since Alfred Kinsey unleashed sexual behavior in the human male on the American public in 1948. The book has now won the Theory Award in Sexology this year for um, by the Foundation for Scientific Study of Sexuality. Peter Sago is a playwright, screenwriter, and actor, and he, of course, is the host of um, uh, National Public Radio's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And he recently published a, a book on vice, which uh, is highly recommended. And so please join me in giving a warm welcome to our two authors. He's got his thing. Um, I'll step at this podium. Hi, I'm Peter Sagel, and um, this is an interesting event, isn't it? I'm assuming, uh, because you're organized people here at the University of Chicago, that you've divided yourself naturally into public radio nerds and sex nerds. <laughs> I know. I was about to say. I, I don't know if that's true. I just wanted to see what would happen if I said that, <laughs> and then who would want to leap across the aisle? Yeah. <laughs> Because, I, I, and I do, I do want to hope that in the Venn diagram of public radio nerds and sex nerds, there is an intersection, because that would, that would do wonders for our demographics. Um, it's pledge, pledge week, by the way. Exactly. Yeah. So, very briefly, because we only have an hour, because the chorus needs the room at 7 o'clock. Uh, a few years ago, I was standing in the Swingers Club, uh, doing research for this book. Thank you, Andres. And uh, this guy who ran the Swingers Club... He was mid-40s, he's a lawyer, and he was arguing vociferously that his vision of human sexuality, this exchange of sexual favors among consenting adults, uh, you know, without any, you know, uh, connection or obligation, was completely natural, that we were, in fact, animal in our nature, and it's time to admit it. And I wondered, is he right? What is a human being's natural sexuality? We know far more, for example, about how and why our teeth evolved than we do about other parts and that's only partly because the other parts in question are soft <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I, I don't get to do sex jokes on my show. Well, not men. So, so, so it turns out I researched this a little bit, and there's a lot of information out there about animal sexuality for everything from the sperm whale to the dung beetle, but there's strikingly little about uh, human sexuality. Most of what you find is supposition based on our understanding of other mammals and animals and, and looking around us at human society and how it has functioned and, and a kind of self-evidence where people go, well, I'm human and this is what I feel, therefore that must be human nature. And then uh, oh, about maybe a little more than a year ago, maybe uh, Dan Savage, uh, sex columnist and, and sort of hero of mine, started going on and on on his podcast and his column about this book called Sex at Dawn by Chris Ryan and Casilda Jetha, a husband and wife uh, team based in Spain. And I got this book, and I read it, and for the first time came across a really compelling argument based on anthropological and psychological and physical evidence about what human sexuality really is, or rather what it was before we started thinking about it and screwed everything up. <laughs> and I became a huge fan of the book, and I promoted it uh, on NPR.org and to my friends, and I got in touch with Chris, and we became friends, and we actually met for the first time tonight, which is very exciting. And now here we both are. Now, that's what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm going to let Chris tell you about his book and what he found, and, and, and after that, uh, I'm going to ask him some of my questions. And we've been going back and forth about this, but we're going to, I, I am, I've decided in the last minute that I'm going to try this. If you have questions for Chris, uh, you can tweet them at me with your little tweeters, 
uh, at Peter Sagel, no punctuation. And if we have time, because we have limited time, I will try to get to them and get your questions in as well. And, and I want to say that I'm looking forward, because this is a book about scientific evidence, to challenge some of this evidence and some of the conclusions and see what Chris's responses are. So no questions like, how great are you and can you meet me later? <laughs> well, I'll take those few, questions because I'm flattered. But. So that's it. I, we'll, we'll do that later. But as for right now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Christopher Ryan. I think this is my one and only chance to stand in a pulpit, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take advantage of it. Uh, well, what I thought I'd do, because as Peter said, we've got very limited time, um, from 7 p.m. onward I'll really be preaching to the choir, uh, because there will be an actual choir here. Uh, so I thought what I would do is uh, read a little bit from the book. Uh, about How many of you have read the book, by the way? Okay, well, I have to come up with some fresh jokes then, I guess. Uh, thank you, those of you who have read the book. And what the hell's wrong with the rest of you? <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say that in this. I, this is really weird to be, uh, I have to say, you know, as a non-Catholic, uh, animist, pagan, if lightning strikes, I'm sorry. I, I hope it doesn't get you. All right, so the idea of the talk tonight was to, to sort of run through some of the different, uh, the variations in human sexual behavior that we find around the world. Part of the book is primatolo uh, primatology. We look at uh, human anatomy. We look at contemporary psychosexuality. And we look at anthropology. So those are the four uh, sources of data that we rely on in the book to sort of build this convergent argument about what sort of animals human beings are in terms of our sexual evolution. Now, I want to say right from the get-go, this book isn't advocating anything. This isn't a, a book saying everyone should be polyamorous or every couple should be swingers or monogamy is unhealthy. In fact, all we're saying is that our ancestors evolved along a certain trajectory, just like with diet. It's obvious, as Peter mentioned, teeth. Uh, you know, you look at our teeth, you look at the, the chemical con um, composition of our saliva, you look at our digestive system, you look at the fact that our eyes are on the front of our, our, fa our heads instead of on the sides. All these different things uh, make it quite clear that our ancestors evolved as um, omnivores. And what we're saying is that we're sexually omnivores as well. Now, that's not saying there's anything wrong with vegetarianism. Right? It's just saying if you choose to be a vegetarian, don't expect it to be easy. Uh, you know, you can choose to be a vegetarian, but that doesn't make you an herbivore. It makes you an omnivore who's chosen to only eat vegetables. That's a different animal. So, uh, you know, just because, as I often say in interviews, if just because you've chosen to be a vegetarian doesn't mean bacon suddenly stops smelling good. Right? Apply that to your sex life and you see what I'm getting at. Um, Okay, now, the, the, what we call the standard argument or the standard narrative of human sexual evolution in the book is a story we all know. Men have always, since the beginning of our species, traded certain goods and services, uh, meat primarily, shelter, protection, status. They've traded these things to a particular woman in exchange for exclusive sexual access to her. Now, why do they make this exchange? To assure their paternity of any children that result from this union. Okay? That's the, the essence of the standard narrative. If that's true, all the things I'm about to tell you shouldn't exist. But they do. So let's start with the Kulina of the Amazon Basin, who have a ritual known as the, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's Dutse uh, Bani Towi translated as the order to get meat. I have to tell you, double entendre is a human universal. Meat <laughs> means meat, but it also means what you think it does. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is from uh, Donald Pollack, who's an anthropologist who lived with the Kulina for many years. This is uh, quoting him. Uh, at the end of the day... Oh, sorry, let me get to the beginning. The, the women go... Uh, 
around in the morning, the women decide that they want meat. They haven't been getting enough meat recently and they want some meat. So they go around in the morning and they sing this song, we don't get enough meat, where's our meat? You guys are lazy, where's our meat? And they go around to each house or each little you know, uh, hammock and a woman will come up from the group and bang on the, on the shack or on the, on the pole holding up the hammock with a stick. And that means that the guy who sleeps there will be able to have sex with her that night if he comes back with meat after hunting. So if he's successful that day. Okay, so that's to motivate the guys. Get them out of the hammock, get them out there. Um, so, okay, the men go out, the men are all, you know, sort of smug. And if a man doesn't really want to have sex with that woman, he'll claim he has stomach problems or whatever. So to avoid hurting anyone's feelings. But the men who are up for it, so to speak, go out uh, and go hunting. All right, now here's where it gets really interesting, right? Some of those men are going to be successful and some aren't. What they do is that they, they, they hunt separately, but before they separate, they agree to meet at a certain time and place before they enter the village. So the guys who got some, normally monkeys, they got monkeys, they'll cut them up so that every guy comes into the village with a piece of monkey. So everyone was successful, right? Uh, so, so to quote Donald Pollock, at the end of the day, the men return in a group to the village where the adult women form a large semicircle and sing erotically provocative songs to the men asking for their meat. <laughs> the men drop their catch in a large pile in the middle of the semicircle, often hurling it down with dramatic gestures and smug smiles. After cooking the meat and eating, each woman retires with the man whom she selected as her partner for the sexual tryst. Kulina engage in this ritual with great humor and perform it regularly. No doubt, right? Okay, now let's go to Paraguay. The Ache, another anthropologist working in Paraguay, asked his Ache subjects to identify their fathers. He was presented with a mathematical puzzle that could be solved only with a vocabulary lesson. The 321 Ache claim to have over 600 fathers. Who's your daddies? It turns out that the Ache distinguish four different kinds of fathers. According to the anthropologist, Kim Hill, the, the four different types of fathers are Miare, who's the father who put it in, Peroare, the fathers, plural, who mixed it. Momboare, those who spilled it out. This is starting to turn into a porn film, right? <laughs> I know, I know at least half of you are seeing a porn film here. And Baikuare, the fathers who provided the child's essence. So all these different types of men, all the, or all these different men, are fathers of a different sort, right? Rather than being shunned as bastards or sons of bitches, children of multiple fathers benefit from having more than one man who takes a special interest in them. Anthropologists have found that their chances of surviving childhood are significantly better than those of children in the same societies who have just one recognized father. So this idea that paternity certainty has always been of utmost importance to our species doesn't make sense. How could this exist? How could men be sharing paternity? Now, all these different societies in the Amazon believe in something that, that anthropologists call partable paternity, which is that a fetus is quite literally composed of accumulated semen. Okay, so when a, a girl starts to menstruate, she's sort of half pregnant, but she won't actually start to have a growing fetus until she's accumulated enough semen that it's reached a tipping point and be, starts to become a baby. So like women everywhere, she wants to have the healthiest, strongest, most intelligent, best looking baby she can possibly have, right? So she'll make sure she has sex with the healthiest guy and the best looking guy and the smartest guy and the best hunter and the in order to get the essence of all these different men into her baby. So this, is, this should be impossible if the standard narrative were, were accurate. Okay, now uh, just to finish that section, Stephen Beckerman, who's, who's uh, at Penn State, who edited this wonderful volume about partable paternity, it's called Cultures of Multiple Fathers, for anyone who's interested, um, writes, that in the worst case scenario, this system may provide extra security for the child. 
quoting him, you know that if you die, there's some other man who has a residual obligation to care for at least one of your children. So looking the other way or even giving your blessing when your wife takes a lover is the only insurance policy you can buy. Okay, now the reason I wanted to, to read that was to make the case that this isn't really just about sex. This isn't really just about getting off. It's about forming meaningful social connections with other people that in the worst case scenario or in the best case scenario can enrich one's life. Um, and that's, I think, why the poly polyamory community is very positive about this book because that's the way they look at their sexuality. If you, if you go to a polyamory meeting or talk to people, they don't, it's not like swingers. It's not like, it's not an orgy scene. It's about forming connections with other people that are meaningful and sex can or, or maybe doesn't become part of that. But it's much more about um, relationships than it is about orgasms. Now, another example of that much closer to home, uh, key parties, uh, the first swingers in contemporary Western society. We say here in the book, asked to imagine the first swingers in modern American history, most people probably picture hairy hippies in headbands lolling about on water waterbeds in free love communes under posters of Che Guevara and Jimi Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane on the hi-fi. But be cool, Daddy-O, because the truth is going to blow your mind. It seems that the original American swingers were crew-cut World War II Air Force pilots and their wives. Think about that. The first American swingers were Air Force pilots during World War II. Like elite warriors everywhere, these top guns often developed strong bonds with one another, perhaps because they suffered the highest casualty rate of any branch of the military. So these guys are facing death. And the way they deal with that existential crisis or threat is making love with other couples. According to journalist Terry Gould, who wrote a book called The Lifestyle, key parties originated on these military bases in the 1940s, where elite pilots and their wives intermingled sexually with one another before the men flew off into Japanese anti-aircraft fire. So again, this is making the point that it's not this idea that our ancestors were having sex more promiscuously than we do isn't a prurient idea so much as understanding the world they lived in and the way of uh, mitigating or spreading risk was often through sexual interaction with one another. How many of you have heard a heterosexual couple having sex? Maybe in the hotel, your neighbors, <laughs> God help us, your parents. Uh, okay, almost everyone it looks like. In how many of those cases was the man making more noise than the woman? Not, oh, 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 maybe half of a, half a hand, uh, yeah. Now, that's really interesting for a species in which the woman is theoretically demure, not very sexual, not interested in, you know, not having as much pleasure as men, you know, that whole cliched uh, vision of human sexuality we have. It turns out that among primates, the primates that are multi-male, multi-female, which is what primatologists, the phrase primatologists use instead of promiscuous, um, the female makes a lot of noise. Scientists call it female copulatory vocalization. And <laughs> there are graduate students in the jungles of the world with directional micro, uh, microphones <laughs> listening to primates having sex. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there are any in Chicago, hopefully not at the Holiday Inn by the airport, but uh, um, anyway, so, so that's just, I'm not gonna get into the primatological stuff, but that's a, a pretty strong indication. Next time you hear people having sex and it's the woman you hear, you think, ah, hmm, promiscuous primate. Oh, by the way, how many primates, of the hundreds of primates, many of whom live in multi-male complex groups, how many of them are monogamous? Well, they, they don't live in multi-male groups, they live in single male family uh, groups. 
Um, that's a little legalistic language there. Um, none except us, if you believe the standard narrative, right? Gibbons are the only ape that's uh, monogamous, supposedly. They don't make any noise when they have sex. <laughs> All right, how are we doing on time? All right, I'm just going to run through this pretty quickly so we can get into conversation. By the way, it's funny, when I do these, these events around the country, um, I've come to the bittersweet conclusion that often people aren't coming to meet me, they're coming to meet each other. So I, I encourage you to interact, uh, you know, beneficially for everyone. Um, we'll be, I should just mention, we'll be uh, downstairs at uh, 7 when we get kicked out of here. Anyone who wants to come down and mingle down there will be uh, down there. Okay, so... Here's another, the Matisse, another, another group from the Amazon basin. Uh, anthropologist uh, Philip Erickson writes that uh, we're talking about plural paternity, which I mentioned earlier, this idea that uh, accumulated semen uh, is necessary to, to create a fetus. He says, plural paternity is more than a theoretical possibility. Extramarital sex is not only widely practiced and usually tolerated, in many respects, it also appears mandatory. Married or not, one has a moral duty to respond to the sexual advances of opposite sex cross cousins under pain of being labeled stingy with your genitals. I love that phrase. Come on, baby, don't be stingy with your genitals. Being labeled a sexual cheapskate is no laughing matter, apparently. Erickson writes of one young man who cowered in the anthropologist's hut for hours, hiding from his horny cousin whose advances he couldn't legitimately reject if she tracked him down. <laughs> Even more serious, during Matisse tattooing festivals, having sex with one's customary partner is expressly forbidden under threat of extreme punishment, even death. You have to have sex with someone else. Now, why? Why would that be necessary? The theory is that it's because it's important, like, just like high school, not to form little cliques, not to form isolated units, to keep every, because in these societies, um, sharing is the central organizing principle of hunter-gatherer societies. So this idea that's promoted in the standard narrative that, you know, the man goes out hunting, he comes back, he shares the meat with his wife and their children. We call that Flintstoneization, this tendency to um, project contemporary situation into prehistory as a way of explaining and justifying the way things are today. This sort of selfish, I've got mine, the hell with you, approach to life is not the way our ancestors lived until very recently. The advent of agriculture is five to 10,000 years ago at most. And as anatomically modern human beings, we've been around for 200,000 years. If you go back into earlier forms of, uh, you know, of humans, uh, much more than that. So we're talking about 5% at most of our existence as a species has been in post-agricultural, hoarding, limited resource kind of mindset. I don't have time to get into that and the implications of that very much, but it's, uh, it's a central point. Okay, so um, stingy with the genitals. We covered that. Okay, last one I want to cover is the Mosuo which are uh, people who live in the foothills of the Himalaya in China. There's a wonderful short documentary on, uh, you can Google Frontline World, just Google Frontline World Mosuo, M-O-S-U-O, beautiful little documentary where they go and interview people there. The Mosuo are people who live around a lake called Lugu Lake. They've been there uh, a long time and have practiced what I'm about to describe for a long time. Marco Polo wrote about them in his uh, accounts of his travels. In the mountains around Lugu Lake, near the border between, between China's Yunnan and Sichuan provinces, live about 56,000 people who enjoy a family system that has perplexed and fascinated travelers and scholars for centuries. The most well revere Lugu Lake as the mother goddess. Their language is rendered in Dongba, the sole pictographic language still in use in the world today. They have no words for murder, war, or rape. The Mosuo's relaxed and respectful tranquility is accompanied by a nearly absolute sexual freedom and autonomy for both men and women. Very interesting society. 
Um, by the way, while, while I'm on this subject, I'm wearing my Bonobo shirt. I don't know if uh, anyone saw Peter's uh, tweet saying that if you wore Bonobo wear, you got in free. Uh, everyone got in free, of course, but I wore my Bonobo shirt anyway. Uh, bono if, you, if you don't know what Bonobos are, Bonobos are equidistant from us with chimpanzees. So if you ever read that chimps are the, the closest primate relative to humans, that's not true. Chimps and bonobos are equidistant from us. Now, why is that important? It's important because every time you read about the primate origins of violence, about any sort of neo-Hobbesian justification for the need for governmental and religious structures to keep us in check, keep us from raping and pillaging and destroying each other, you always read about the chimps those nasty, nasty chimps, right? They, they're male-dominated, very hierarchical. There's evidence that they've uh, engaged in warfare between different groups. The rape is common, infanticide, murder. They're, they can be quite nasty. They bit off someone's face in Connecticut, of all places. So, you know, and if you're going to bite off someone's face in Connecticut, you're pretty tough. So, uh, bonobos, on the other hand, which share the same amount of DNA with humans as chimps do. In over 40 years of observation in the wild and in captivity, there has never been observed a single case of, of war between groups, of murder of one bonobo of another, infanticide, or rape. That is relevant to these discussions. But uh, I hope that all of you will keep that in mind next time you read some popular account of the origins of human violence that talks about chimps, they don't mention the damn bonobos. You know, and to me that, that's very aggravating and it feels very uh, dishonest. Okay, so the Mosuo refer to their, their arrangement as sese, which means walking. Okay? Now, anthropologists still refer to this as marriage. They call it walking marriage. And they list the Mosuo among the societies around the world that practice marriage. But as you'll see, this has nothing to do with marriage, right? Um, the Mosuo themselves disagree with this depiction of their system as marriage. Quoting uh, a, a Mosuo woman, by any stretch of the imagination, Seise are not marriages, says Yang Erche Namu a Mosuo woman who published a memoir about her childhood among the Mosuo. All, quoting again, all seisei are of the visiting kind and none involves the exchange of vows, property, the care of children, or expectations of fidelity. The Mosuo language, in fact, has no word for husband or wife, preferring the word asu, which means friend. Now what happens with the Mosuo is the house is built around a central courtyard and the mother and the women live in this house. The men are expected to sleep. There's a separate, like a sort of a shack where the men can sleep if they don't have girlfriends to sleep with. The girls, upon reaching sexual maturity, get a room that opens onto the courtyard and also opens onto the street. And so the girl can, can invite anyone she wants. You know, the boys, will, boys or men will come by, you know, in the evening and sing or knock on the door or whatever. And she can have a different guy every night. She can have three guys in one night. She can do whatever she wants. And gossiping about another person's sex life in the Mosuo society is seen as the most reprehensible, you know, low-class thing you can do. It's, very, it's shameful to talk about someone else's sex life. Um, whereas there's no shame at all associated with the sex life itself. Okay, sort of the opposite of our situation. So now you might say, okay, but what happens when the babies? Come, right? What do we do with the babies? Well, the parental responsibility for the baby falls to the woman, right? Her sisters and her brothers. So the brothers of the mother are the male role models for that child's life. The biological father has no role whatsoever, unimportant. So again, this is another very strong, I would say devastating counterexample to the, the standard narrative which claims that men have always been obsessed with controlling female sexual behavior as a way of asserting their paternity certainty. Okay, So the implications of that obviously are quite far-ranging. You've got you know, couples where the man is happy to see his wife having sex with someone else. He actually gets off on it. Now, are those people sick? 
According to the standard narrative, there's something sick about that. But according to the narrative we, we propose in Sex at Dawn, that makes perfect sense. There's no problem. So you can see that the, the implications are pretty, I think, far-ranging and, and very importantly um, show that female power, autonomy, uh, the respect for female, for, for women or females, because bonobos are female-dominated society, um, is intrinsic to any sort of uh, social system in which people are sexually free, sexually um, satisfied, and um, overall much more happy. Chimps are much happier, or bonobos are much happier than chimps, generally. Um, with that, I think I will finish up so we've got half an hour to talk and, and answer questions. Okay, thank you. So, I just want you to know that I once chewed a face off in Connecticut, but I don't like to talk about it. It can happen. Don't judge. Um, before, I, I have a few questions, and like I said, I'm going to invite you guys to tweet at me at Peter Sagel, at Peter Sagel on Twitter if you have some. But uh, before I get to my questions, I want to make sure I understand the central thesis of the book so that we can proceed from there. And, and the central thesis, as you just touched on in various ways, is that it is at least as likely, I don't think you go so far as to say this absolutely happened, but is at least as likely that contrary to the standard model as you described of men possessing women and establishing paternity and women trying to cheat when they can and men cheating when they can, that is at least as likely that humans evolved in a bonobo-like society in which there was multi-male, multi-female sexuality that was a form of bonding and social sharing that contributed to the group cohesion that was necessary for survival as hunter-gatherers. Is that right? One sentence? Yep. Okay. A long one, but it's a, a long one. one. All right. I had to get a lot in. Um, and so that means that our natural sexual urges would be oriented because it evolved forever many hundreds of thousands or millions of years along those lines, that we would, we would evolve to live in that kind of society and that this kind of more possessive, monogamous society doesn't fit us well, which is one of the reasons why we have so many problems with it. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is to explain Jill Morris. Who? Who, exactly. <laughs> Jill Morris was my college uh, senior girlfriend. <laughs> Trick question. And uh, I know. I was going to catch him up. And this is what happened, and I'm sure you guys are in college, or maybe some of you are, so if this hasn't happened to you, it might, in that Jill and I had this fabulous romance. It was great. It was passionate. It was wonderful. And then Jill dumped me from other guy, Roddy Teeple. And I was absolutely devastated. I was destroyed by this. I yeah. was so jealous and so envious and so... Uh, what's the word, uh, deprived, uh, I think, by this terrible loss. Yeah. So you're not going to tell me, <clears throat> or, or, or is it your thesis, that, that those feelings of jealousy and possessiveness and envy, i.e. that this woman who was mine was no longer mine, that's, is that a cultural construct? Because it felt very organic. And as I'm sure the same similar experiences happen to everybody. Yeah, we, we make a big point at the beginning of the book talking about food uh, and the different things that people eat around the world. You know, in Peru, people make beer out of saliva. They, they sort of chew on some beans or I don't remember what it is, and then they spit into these gourds, and the saliva has some enzyme that makes it ferment, and then they all drink this saliva beer, right? Now, to me, that organically would make me wretch. Right? There's no doubt about it. Or we talk about people eating grubs and insects and so on. So the point of that is just because something feels natural, don't believe it is. You can't, you can't base your sense of what's natural on what feels natural to you. It feels natural for us to eat you know, cows but not dogs. Well, why? You know, in other parts of the world, they're eating dogs. I've eaten dogs. I didn't know it at the time. I kept going to this restaurant in Sumatra and playing with the puppies. And then after like three days, they were like, where are all the puppies? And they're like, on your plate, you idiot. No. That's neither here nor there. But if I had known I was eating puppies, I would have been going to that house to eat the, the delicious sauce. Um, so the point is, something feeling natural is not a, a reliable guide to whether it is or not. Now, you used the word mine. This woman, he was mine, was no longer mine, okay? That, I think, is a very cultural 
uh, way of looking at things. And when you look at other societies, you find that using the word mind to describe another person would be extremely offensive, right? Um, so I think I'm sort of, ha- I, I, I'm sort of half, half here, half there on the question of jealousy. I think that in as much as jealousy is an expression of insecurity and not wanting to lose something that's really important to you, then of course it's human nature. You know, you can see that with dogs and cats. They don't want to lose their spot in the sun. They don't want to lose their comfortable little bed by the fire, whatever it is. But applying this to uh, our sexual partners and saying that, uh, well, if she has a sexual experience with someone else, that is therefore taking something away from me. This sort of zero-sum conception of sexuality, I think, is extremely cultural. And that's why we go through all these different counterexamples in the book of showing, like, wait a minute, there are many societies around the world where people don't respond to these in the same way. Now, going back to the the first part, there is some inherent uh, fear or uh, fear of loss and insecurity and so on. And so what we see is in societies where, what we see is that there are societies that play down that fear like I said about the Mosuo, talking about someone else's sex life is shameful and, and you would be ostracized if you did it too much. Um, and then there are societies that play up the fear, like ours. And we talk in the book about you know, some of the most famous love songs. When a man loves a woman, everybody knows that song, right? Percy Sledge, great song. What will he do? How do you know when a man loves a woman? Well, he'll spend his very last dime to give her what she needs, he'll turn his back on his best friend if he says anything bad about her, and he'll sleep out in the rain if she says that's the way it has to be. Now give me a break. That's love? A guy sleeping in the rain because the woman's like, get the hell out of here, go sleep in the street? That's not love, that's insanity, you know? Um, So I think it's important to look at how cultures play up these things or play down these things uh, when we look at whether or not something's natural and... uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I think. Okay. I mean, because I mean, I, I think that you know, I'll, I'll, there's been this tremendous—I won't say tremendous—but there's been this visceral reaction to your book among non-scientists. There was that one blog post you shared at me, some political blogger, and, and and the critique was, well, if we evolve to share each other's sexual partners as part of a larger group, then how come I feel so jealous, or how come I can't yeah. stand at the thought of my girlfriend or boyfriend being with somebody else? That's such an inherent feeling. Sure, but I mean, scientifically, that's a non-issue. You know, if we evolved eating insects, how come I don't want to eat any insects? Come on. We yeah. did involve eating insects, right. you know. We have one of my mother's insects that were fabulous. Oh. Um, <laughs> and actually, this, this sort of segues in, into my next question, which was about the scientific response to the book, which, for the most part, as far as I have been able to tell, has been almost non-existent, in that I haven't seen it, and I don't follow the academic literature that much, but I haven't seen it debated in sort of academic circles. This is a story that Chris knows because I told him. Um, Steven Pinker is one of the scientists, an evolutionary psychologist who they critique in the book, and I happened to see him deliver a, a speech uh, last summer, and I found him afterwards because I really wanted to say, have you read Sex at Dawn, which critiques some of your thesis? And um, he said no, and I said, well, let me describe it to you, and I sort of stumbled through a description. We were walking along a path. He was on his way someplace. And he finally looked at me and said, oh, is this the bonobo, the bonobo stuff? And I was like, well, yeah. And he was like, oh, that. And, and, he, and he made a gesture, which was remarkable for a Harvard professor, of complete contempt, in that he, he felt that apparently what he then said is that ever since studies were done on the sexualities of bonobos back in the, whoever, the 60s, there have been an attempt to say, oh, we're like bonobos, we're all supposed to be sleeping with each other, and, and serious science has dismissed this. So my first question, it's not fair to ask you this, I guess, but i got no one else here, why? <laughs> why, why have they dismissed why it? Why have they dismissed what Stephen Picker called, oh, that bonobo stuff? Because it threatens the dominant paradigm, and they're, they're invested in the dominant paradigm. You know, I, I often say I went to a, a second-rate grad school, thank God, because if I had gone to a good grad school, I would have had mentors and, and advisors who, were, who had bought into that and who would have been very threatened by my having written my dissertation about I probably wouldn't have been able to write my dissertation about uh, challenging the dominant narrative of uh, human sexual evolution. You know, that, that's the way these things work. I, I, and, and I have to say, 
I'm not here saying I'm definitely right. You know, Casilda and I are 100% certain that our view is correct. But certainly, if you read the book, I think we make a very strong argument. Um, and I think our argument makes a lot more sense than Steven Pinker's argument or the other arguments that are out there. Because if you look at the other arguments, you know, they're sort of patched together. You know, like, for example, um, you know, human beings are inarguably among the most sexual creatures on the planet. Think of how many times, and this is a young crowd, but think, you know, someone, you, Peter, you're, you're not that young, <laughs> not that young, okay. That's so, terrible, so I'm looking around for the room for someone old. You. <laughs> you. <laughs> well, there's a decrepit person sitting next to me. Great, he'll be, he'll be an example. <laughs> so you've got your iPad there, get out your calculator and calculate how many times you've had sex in your life, including, <laughs> including masturbation. I'll need to take off my shoes. <laughs> Classic joke. Go on. Yeah. Count with your toes. Yes. Okay. Uh, divide that by how many children you've had, right? Right. You get a ratio. Most people get a ratio, if you've got any luck at all, uh, of a thousand to one or more, right? Now, how many times does a female gorilla have sex for each birth? 10 to 15. Okay? Most animals only have sex when the female is ovulating. Human beings and a very few other mammals have sex when the female is not ovulating. Now, evolutionarily, that makes sense because you're having sex, you're vulnerable to predators. If you're having sex with a human female, you're making lots of noise. You know, leopards are saying, ooh, listen to that. Um, <laughs> you know, you could fall out of the tree. By the way, that's why your toes curl when you have an orgasm. <laughs> really? <laughs> Gentlemen, yes. Uh, gentlemen, if you want to know if she's faking, look at her toes. <laughs> All right? Unless you're with a woman in the crowd tonight, in which case she may be faking even with her toes. Um, but uh, I can't help you there. Um, yeah, that's, that's why, you know, to hold on to the tree. So uh, what, what was I talking about? You were talking. I, I, Who cares? I tell, think tell about curling about toes. toes and I lose Yeah, I know. Track. We just lose our minds. Oh, oh the, okay. So human females have sex when they're menstruating, when they're lactating, when they're already pregnant, when they're postmenopausal. You know, we have sex all the time. Very, very few other animals do that. One, bonobos. <laughs> tell Steven Pinker that, right? Uh, bonobos and dolphins which are both highly intelligent, highly social species, which, from my perspective, serves to reinforce the notion that sexual interaction for highly intelligent, highly social mammals is about forming these complex social groups. Look at us as an animal. We're not very impressive, right? We're not very strong. We're not very fast. We're not very fierce. You know, what do we do? What are we good at? We're good at forming social units that are highly adaptive. Individually, we're not very highly adaptive, but our social units are extremely adaptive, which is why we're under, overrunning the planet. Um, so sexuality feeds into that and, uh, and reinforces that social mechanism. Um, Did you get your number? I, you got I, your I, ratio? You don't want to know it. <laughs> I beat out the gorilla, you'll be happy to know. <laughs> um, I want to ask you specifically about this criticism from the, um, that one review. Uh, and this is actually kind of funny because I, I posted on my blog that I'd be talking to Chris tonight and some very nasty person said, well, you should ask him about this review of his so-called work. And I wrote back to him and I was like, well, actually, I know because Chris sent it to me. Uh, it's in the journal Evolutionary Psychology and, and the, the critique from somebody who knows the literature far better than I do accuses you guys basically of cherry picking in the sense that if there's a tribe of hunter-gatherers, foragers, whatever, that supports one aspect of your argument, you'll cite that while ignoring some other aspect of the tribe. Uh, the one example they use is the, I'm going to try to say this only because I've always wanted to, the Ung people. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Because you, <laughs> you, you, you cite them as an example of the kind of sharing of resources, but you ignore the fact that they're very warlike and male dominant and have a high murder rate. Sure. So how do you respond to that criticism? Any book is cherry picking, you know? But if you get a big enough basket of cherries, you've got an argument. Uh, you know, you can't say everything about every society you're talking about or you're writing an academic treatise on one society, which isn't what we set out to do. So if the point, you know, th those are two different chapters, right? Where one chapter we're talking about the arguments about the origins of warfare, different chapter we're talking about uh, sharing of sexual partners and, and resources and so on. 
Um, it's impossible to write a book where you talk about every aspect of every society that you, you mention or you know, every individual or every situation. So guilty as charged um, in terms of cherry picking, but I would challenge that person or anyone else to find a book that isn't cherry picking to some extent because you know, when you're forming an argument, you naturally choose evidence that supports your argument, and that's the conversation. That's what a lawyer does. That's what an academic does. That's what everyone does. So in our book, we've got extensive endnotes, extensive references. Everything we cite is the original um, work is cited in the book and on our website. So as I say, we're not arguing that this is the end of the conversation. What we're trying to do is move the conversation forward. And um, you know, I welcome uh, critiques on specific points and so on. I don't have time to answer everyone. But if, certainly if Steven Pinker writes to me, I'll write back. <laughs> um, and, and this actually kind of goes to that, and I've been thinking about this a lot, because one of the reasons that the reaction to the book has been so positive among readers, and in some cases negative among some other readers, is because it's so tied up in human feeling, right? I mean, I think of another paradigm shift in science, say, the, the discovery of, of uh, plate tectonics which was some guy came up with this idea, people said, no, that can't be true, and eventually it was proved right. Well, nobody has an emotional investment over whether North Africa, excuse me, North America and Africa are moving closer or farther apart. Right. But people have uh, intense emotional investments in this. How much of this, of your work, was driven by what you wanted to be true? Because your description of human nature, of human sexuality, is so much more pleasant and freeing than what your critique, what you critique, as you say, is I think you're, you, the way you put it is like Darwin called your mother a whore. Because it puts, it puts men in the position of being philanderers, it puts women in the, in the position of being prostitutes, tra trading sex for value. Your version is so much more wonderful in terms of what it says about us as a species and also what it says about what we can and should be doing now amongst each other. Right. So how much did that drive you in this work? That's an excellent question. And, and it's the same question my very best friend asked me upon reading the book. He said, you know, he really enjoyed reading it. And he said, has it occurred to you that this book is just a very long justification for your life? <laughs> <laughs> I've had more sex than my best friend has, I guess, so that he's a little jealous. Right. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, uh, it's a great question, but it's a question I don't really have an answer for. It's kind of like the cherry picking question in the sense that you form an argument, you put it together as best you can, you cite your sources so that people can argue effectively with what you're saying, and you send it out there into the world and you see what happens. Uh, as far as my motivations, I had worked on probably three other PhD thesis ideas, and all of which uh, um, I'm, I still find fascinating as ideas, but that I wasn't that interested in, you know? And I, I couldn't see, like, one of them was working with um, oncologists, and I wanted to understand what sort of doctor could face existential despair day after day and lose most of or almost all of their patients and you know not get burned out and I wanted to develop research around the psychological profile of oncologists and so on. but after a while it's like do I really want to be an expert on this you know do I want to spend my life going to conferences and and you know then when I I read a book called The Moral Animal by Robert Wright which is a beautifully written um, book that sort of puts forward the standard narrative, a very articulate, wonderfully written book. And I was thrilled. I thought, this explains everything. This is fantastic. And for about six months, I really was excited about this. And I was running around telling everyone, yeah, men are trading status in meat, and oh, that's why we're... And luckily, I was working for this nonprofit in San Francisco at the time called Women in Community Service. It was all women and me. And I had to answer the phone, women in community service, which caused some strange situations. But anyway, the, the women were really smart and outspoken, you know, Berkeley lesbian feminist type. And they, and my girlfriend was a stripper at the time, which is another part of the story. But anyway, from both sides, I was hearing from, from really smart, articulate women saying, you know, I think you're full of shit. 
That's, maybe that's the way men think, but that's not the way women experience sexuality. And so that sort of derailed me and made me go in and look at the, the original research that Wright was using in his book. And that's when I started to come across all these exceptions. Like, wait a minute, what about the bonobos? What about all these different tribes in the Amazon? What about Papua New Guinea? What about homosexuality? In you know, the standard narrative, everyone's always talking about homosexuality. It's this big mystery. How can it possibly have continued? right? They don't reproduce. How can it continue? According to this sort of standard narrative, it shouldn't. But when you say, wait a minute, human sexuality isn't primarily about reproduction. You know, fewer than 1% of our sexual interactions result in pregnancy. When you see it that way, then homosexuality is no longer an issue. It's no longer a conundrum. They're making social connections just like anyone else. Um, and, and sexuality is not about having babies. Babies are a byproduct of human sexuality. Um, so anyway, to what extent uh, was it motivated? I'd certainly say my interest in the subject is motivated by the fact that you know, I, I was a very horny 20-year-old, 15-year-old, and so on. Less so now. Yeah, well, you know, us old guys. But uh, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, sexuality is inherently interesting, so that's certainly motivation. You're, you're, we have a couple minutes um, before we have to get out and let the chorus come in. Uh, I have. It's funny. I'm getting some tweets. I got one from David, who's, who's actually directed at me. He says, "Your feelings are a remnant of being cast out from the entire tribe, possibly." Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to ask you, and actually. I got a question from someone who calls themselves Floating Lotus, and it's about the ne next question I was going to ask. Um, and the, the way that she puts it is, we, will we ever, I'm assuming it's a she, uh, will we ever shift away from the standard narrative and return to our roots? How do we foster that trajectory? Which brings up a question is that you are somewhat famously, for those of us who followed you, uh, you have refused to be a prescriptive, i.e., because of our findings, everybody should do X or Y. Sure. Or everybody should do Bob and Jill or whatever it is you want to say. <laughs> uh, my, my first question is, why are you refusing to be prescriptive? And secondly, would you give that up and be prescriptive now? <laughs> um, when we first pitched the book to publishers, uh, I probably spoke to 15 different editors who were interested enough to call me in Spain and spend an hour on the phone, and, which is sort of like the last job interview you know, in the, in the process. And probably of those 15, probably 12 were pushing for a prescriptive book. And when we refused, they dropped their offer. They weren't interested in publishing it. Um, I remember one from Penguin was like, okay, I, I buy it, I buy it, now what? What do we do? How does this affect work? How does it affect schooling? How's it affect... And my, my point was, look, this is about the science of how we got to be the way we are. This isn't about what to do. I don't know what to do, you know? No, it doesn't matter what I think. Because, you know, are you a 50-year-old person married with three kids and a mortgage and da-da-da? Or are you 22 years old starting out in your sexual romantic life where you can put the stuff on the table from the get-go? You know, who are you? What's your situation? What kind of relationship do you have? I can't tell people what to do, you know? Um, Casilda is a, a psychiatrist. She's done a lot of therapy, couples therapy and so on. I'm not even a clinical psych psychologist. You know, I, I do research. So... Uh, we're not qualified, first of all, to give that sort of advice. I don't think anyone is, frankly. And, you know, the people you've never met. Um, and as far as how can we get back there, something I didn't mention in answering the previous question, like that this is very hopeful in a way, you know, that this is uh, optimistic. It is and it isn't. Because from my perspective, it's not really that optimistic. It's sort of tragic. It, this understanding of human sexual evolution leaves me feeling like, why did we mess this up so badly? Why did we take something so potentially beautiful? I think it was like the solar energy of the soul, you know? No victim, no waste, no contamination, no pollution. And we've made a mess of it. And we've made sexuality something that's shameful, that's about power and abuse, and you know, we're hiding away, and it's all... It didn't have to be that way. So really, from my perspective, it's not that hopeful a message. <laughs> it's kind of depressing, actually. Um, I don't want to leave us on that note. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh well, God. okay. Well, so maybe we will find our way back to the garden. I, I know. I, yeah. I can tell Andres Pe is a little people nervous. People are coming in. Is, yeah, is, we have is, to go. Let me just let me just say this. It, 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 if there's one thing that I found hopeful, so I can, we can just end on a positive note, and hopefully you agree. And I noticed a lot of people have responded to the book this way: that um, the message of the book is for those people who find themselves constricted in all kinds of different ways by what society or their family imposes on them, be it the most conservative Christian or any other religion kind of thing, and they feel that they don't fit, they feel there's something unnatural about them. It seems like the message of your book is it's not that you're unnatural, it's that the positions upon you are. Exactly. And exactly. that you should feel that the fault not lies not in you as you right. go forward and try to manage Which this isn't problem, a license to be. cheat and lie and deceive. It's simply saying an understanding of where you come from, the design that you're living in, uh, informs your decisions, and hopefully you'll make better decisions and, and find a way to be more authentic in your life. There you go. That's it. Positive message. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Chris Ryan. We'll see you downstairs. All right. Oh, I bet. <laughs>